Good morning, everybody. Even if we didn't hear it, we saw last week that Paul had taken a non-Jewish companion and a non-Jewish gospel with him to Jerusalem, to the heartland of monotheistic Judaism. We experienced him wondering about the reaction he would receive there from the apostles. Would they receive Titus as a brother or reject him because he was uncircumcised? Would they accept Paul's gospel or would they attempt to modify it in some way or other? And then we saw that Titus was accepted and Paul's gospel also. That this was a great and resounding victory for the tr truth of the gospel. The heavyweights, the original members, the writers of scripture, the founders of the churches, the servants of the Lord were united. Not at the expense of truth, but on the basis of truth. Nothing was missing, only the sound. This week we begin with a new topic, orthodox stance, coming probably to one of the most tense and most dramatic episodes in the New Testament. Here are two leading apostles of Jesus Christ face to face in complete and open conflict. When Paul visited Jerusalem, Peter, together with James and John, gave him the right hand of fellowship. When Peter visited Antioch, Paul opposed him to his face. He adopted an orthodox stance and gave him, so to speak, an orthodox right hand. This exchange between Peter and Paul that Jean kindly read for us shows what happens when the gospel culture we are creating goes against the gospel doctrine we proclaim. It's possible, so to speak, to unsay or to undo with our actions what we say with our mouths. It's common, and every time it happens, it's a disappointment to those around us. But inside a church, it's more than a disappointment. It's a denial of the good news. It makes a mockery of the work of Jesus Christ. So maybe someone comes up to me and says, I cannot hear what you were saying because your life is speaking too loudly. Or it would be equally tragic, wouldn't it, if someone said, don't do as I do, but do as I say. That would be hypocritical, wouldn't it? Hypocrite comes from the Greek word Hippocrates, which means an actor. The Greek word took on an extended meaning to refer to any person who was wearing a figurative mask and pretending to be someone or something they were not. Are we who we say we are? Are we who we claim to be? Are we genuine? Are we authentic? Are we real? In Galatians 2, 13 and 14 we read, the other Jews joined Peter in his hypocrisy so that by their hypocrisy even Barnabas was led astray. When I saw that they were not acting in line with the gospel, I said to Cephas in front of them all, you are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile, a non-Jew, and live not like a Jew. How is it then that you force non-Jews to follow Jewish customs? Well, there are many early church writers who say, well, that wasn't a real fight. But Augustine interpreted the story as a genuine conflict in which Paul established the higher claim of the truth of the gospel over the rank and office of Peter. Yes, it was a real battle between the giants of the church. Paul opposes Peter to his face. It wasn't that Peter was merely following a personal preference. No, Peter was giving the non-Jews in Antioch notice that they could not be set right with God unless they were to abstain from certain foods. He was adding law on top of grace, which wiped out grace entirely. Peter wasn't just mistaken, he was completely out of step with the truth of the gospel. As Paul writes, when I saw that they were not acting in line with the gospel, Peter was way out of line. He should have known better. In Acts 10, he received a vision in which he was commanded to rise, kill, and eat all kinds of animals. He didn't understand it at first. 
probably we wouldn't have understood it either but God told him that what he had made clean he should not call common according to the law of Moses certain animals were unclean not to be eaten but through Christ God had freed his people from the law Peter finally understood it when at the same time men who had been sent by Cornelius a non-Jew came and asked him to come to their city Peter went saying truly I understand that God shows no partiality but in every nation anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him God used animals to reveal to Peter that non-Jews are acceptable Peter believed non-Jews were animals but God says no they are my children now Peter's racism ran very deep it took nothing less than a vision from God to break the pre-recorded tapes filling and dominating Peter's mind but that recorded story lived on in Peter's mind he had done, downloaded it onto his Seagate hard disk drive so when he was in mixed company in Galatia he chose the path of least resistance to his own heart he chose to separate himself from the non-Jews in favor of the Jews he knew the non-Jews were accepted by God as they were they did not have to become Jews to become Christians any more than Peter had to become a non-Jew to become a Christian but what Peter didn't know what Peter knew didn't stop him from acting on the basis of what he felt as you probably know self-justification describes how when a person encounters cognitive dissonance or a situation in which a person's behavior is inconsistent with their beliefs that person tends to justify the behavior and to deny any negative feedback associated with the behavior and maybe Peter could justify his own behavior to himself he probably had an excuse if he had expressed his own reason for separating from the non-Jews in Antioch he would have said well what about the detrimental effect this eating with non-Jews would have on the Jerusalem's church missions the Jerusalem church's mission to the Jews when non-Christian Jews in Jerusalem heard that Peter a prominent church leader an apostle was eating with non-Jews in Antioch they would not only turn away from the witness of the church but also become actively hostile towards the church for tolerating such a practice confronted by these practical concerns for his home church and its mission to the Jews Peter acted against his own better judgment he separated himself from the non-Jews this action was completely inconsistent with his own convictions with what he believed about the truth of the gospel he was more influenced in his behavior by his common racial identity as a Jew than by his new experience of unity in Christ with all believers of every race even Barnabas was led astray Barnabas is the first pastor of the church in Antioch he had warmly welcomed non-Jewish believers he'd worked alongside Paul in that church and in their mission of planting non-Jewish churches in Galatia Peter was probably thinking well let's not take the grace of God too far and who am I to offend these people from Jerusalem their feelings matter too so we should probably take the gradual approach yes the gradual approach that will avoid controversy that will be good then we'll meet in the middle somewhere and this whole thing will just blow over in other words Peter chose not to keep in step with the gospel but to walk in step with the legalists but he had no right to settle for that way the way of false peace what was at stake here was not just a matter of degree or a matter of process or a matter of nuance what was at stake here was the same thing as is at stake in every church at every time all the time and here it is who is an insider and who is an outsider and on what basis can we distinguish insiders from outsiders it's a very simple question it's not a matter of compromise it's not it's an either or either the non-jews were insiders 
or they were outsiders. It couldn't be a little bit of both, with one foot in and the other foot out. Who is legitimately a member of the body of Christ? What is it that makes a fully approved member of the body of Christ? Paul answered that question by looking at Jesus. What does his gospel say? Justification by faith alone clearly says that the blood of Jesus is enough to make anyone an insider. If you've put your sins onto Christ crucified, you're clean and you belong. If you belong to Jesus, you belong to the church, no matter what your background might be. No matter what your culture is. No matter what your ethnicity is, or your politics, or any other element of human identity. You might or might not be mature, you may or may not be ready for leadership, but Jesus says you belong whoever you are. If you come to Jesus with empty hands of faith, he receives you, he accepts you, and so do we. How can we reject people that God accepts? He accepts us, we accept everyone that God accepts. We come to the Lord in faith. We grow in our relationship to the Lord by faith. We live with the Lord by faith. The method, the way is always the same. The approach is the same. The means is the same, by faith. Now supposing I do some ironing and I set up the ironing board, I collect the dried washing and I get the iron. I have an electric iron so I put the plug in the socket and I switch it on and then I iron. And supposing I have to break off when somebody calls, then I would switch off and disconnect the iron from the mains. Eventually I can restart. Supposing I use all my strength as I try to put pressure on the iron to smooth the linen bedclothes, to do a good job on my shirts. But if I do not connect to the socket, it's going to look really funny, isn't it? I started with connecting to the mains the first time. Then that is what I should do again. The electric iron needs external power, external warmth and light to be a useful tool. Or think about this, Johnny and Nigel show me how to use the man's lawn mower. They show, him, show me how it works, take it out of the garage, bring it to the lawn, check the fuel, check the choke and then pull and the motor starts. So I am through quickly with the smaller front lawn and decide to go to the larger back lawn which resembled at that time something rather different from a lawn. So what do I do? Do I decide to push the lawnmower as hard as I can? No. I started using the lawnmower in the front by checking the fuel, using the choke and pulling the cable. Why should I try using all my massive strength to cut the grass by force? Even if it doesn't look like the lawnmower will fix the lawn, which is now looking more like a harvest field. Have you got it about the harvest field, I mean? So it is with Jesus. We get to know him through faith. We accept him through faith. And we live daily through faith. If I became a Christian yesterday by faith, should I get up today and do it differently? Should I get up today and do it my way? By grace. Through faith. Not by race, but by grace. Not by education, not by political allegiance, but by grace. Not by religious observance, but by grace. Not by attending every meeting of the church. Not by being a respectable member of the community. Not by donations to charitable causes. Not by serving as a magistrate. Only by grace through faith. God's grace to us through faith. And even this faith is not of ourselves. It is the gift of God. Being born a Jew provided certain benefits and privileges. Peter and Paul were born into the family of God. They didn't have to wait to hear God's word. It was spoken over them at birth. As they grew, they learned the law. They were taught what is clean and what is unclean. They were brought up in the community of God's chosen people, but they knew that wasn't what saved them. Jesus Christ saved them. It wasn't their obedience to the law, it was Christ's. Since Jesus made these Jews righteous by faith, 
The same remedy will cure the non-Jew sinners. In these two verses, Paul sets the false teacher's doctrine of justification by works against the gospel doctrine of justification by faith. Peter's actions denied the truth of the gospel. He knew everyone is made righteous based on Christ's finished work. But he acted as if it was the law that set one right with God. That's why Paul launches into a heavily doctrinal section from verse 15. What we believe must determine how we act. And when we act out of step from what we believe, we need to circle back to that belief and reinforce it. Peter's response to the delegation from Jerusalem and his withdrawal from the integrated fellowship of the church has been excused by many who think he was appropriately sensitive to the demands of his own mission to the Jews and was simply fitting in with those he was trying to win to Christ. <coughs> if Paul himself could become all things to all men to win some to Christ, why was it wrong for Peter to follow the same principle of accommodation, fitting in, when he adapted himself to the preferences and sensitivities of his home church. Paul did not assert his authority as an apostle directly appointed by Jesus Christ or as one of the senior leaders of the church in Antioch, nor did he appeal to the authority of the decision of the Jerusalem Conference. Paul's refusal to follow Peter's example as all the other Jewish Christians did and his open rebuke of Peter were based solely on the standards set by the gospel. Paul saw that strenuous action was necessary to avoid and counteract a drift which had occurred. He did not wait. He struck. It made no difference to him that this drift was connected with the name and conduct of Peter. It was wrong and that was all that mattered to him. A famous name, as William Barclay says, can never justify an infamous action. Paul made nails with heads. This is a German expression in his translation of Macht den Nägel mit Köpfen. It means to do things right, to do things straight and with 100% commitment. Paul did not mess around. Luther did not mess around either. He came to understand justification as being entirely the work of God. That is why faith alone makes someone just and fulfills the law, said Luther. Faith is that which brings the Holy Spirit through the merits of Christ. Well, I know what you're thinking. You're saying, well, I know that already. Or maybe you're thinking, why are we spending so much time looking at Paul's theological observations and battles with other leading church figures in these messages on Galatians? They belong in the first century. Well, let me tell you the answer to your question. The reason is very simple. It's because if we don't grasp this, we have missed the main point. It's the issue we must get right to understand the heart of God. So Paul keeps going on a bit now about this and not being justified by law and being justified alone through faith in Christ. And in fact, he repeats himself several times from verse 15 onwards, again and again and again and again. He says more or less the same thing. Why? Has he got nothing better to say? No, because it is so basic. It is so central. It is so critical not only to our understanding of salvation, but to our being saved. Because we are often in danger of forgetting it. You see, the trouble with learning the A, B, C of the gospel may be that when we have got to H or maybe to L, we tend to forget A. We think we know it all. Because we dart off so quickly on a performance-oriented, self-centered salvation strategy. We look to ourselves, we change lanes, and we forget that at the end of the important crossroads ahead, we will be sent in the wrong direction. <clears throat> Two weeks before I arrived in Blackburn, electronic warning signs triggered by vehicles driving the wrong way onto motorways started being trialled in Scotland following a series of fatal crashes 
in East and West Lothian. They must have known I was coming. How easy it is to go in the wrong direction. Let this message be a clear warning sign to all of us to live by faith and not by works. And finally, this is one of Paul's favourite words, you usually find it in the middle of his letters, but it's at the close of my sermon today. We come finally to Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I hear you thinking that sounds like maybe I lose my personal identity. But that could not, could not be further from the new normal. That could not be more distant from the new reality. That could not be more different from the truth which we experience when we come to know the Lord. We are then out of lockdown. We are then free. The distance has gone. For he is then living in us, in you and in me. Our digital identity comes to define us in so many ways. So it is with sin. It defines our nature, our character, our very personality. Our ability to serve God, our ability to listen and talk with him, our ability to take our place as one of his people, these abilities disappeared when we went against God completely. We don't just need forgiveness, we need a brand new spiritual identity. He gives us our brand new identity, united with Jesus' resurrected life. This same Jesus said, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, I am sorry, Paul said, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. It's a very old story, but it's still a very helpful illustration. Two men stand at Speaker's Corner in Hyde Park in London, looking at the disheveled, poorly dressed man. The first stands up and says to the assembled crowd, if this man joins the communist movement, I will put new clothes on him, from head to toe. And the second stands up and says clearly, if this man gives his life back to Jesus Christ, God will put a new man in these clothes. Jesus said, before long, the world will not see me anymore. But you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. I would expect you've been following the theme of the hymns and worship songs this morning. Our opening hymn was, Christ lives in me. Our second hymn was, yet not I, but through Christ in me. Our third was, it's no longer I that live. And after this message, we will hear our fourth, see the light, where we will hear and see the same message very loud and very clear, a joyful, jubilant, victorious celebration of Christ living in us. Paul's orthodox right hand did not knock Peter out. I don't even think it knocked him down. Paul was by all accounts a very slightly built man who would have had more than a little difficulty with Tyson Fury or Anthony Joshua. His right hand was orthodox in the sense that it came from the right to stand up for the truth of the gospel. That is the orthodox stance. That is our message this morning. Amen.